religion versus God. And what I mean by that, real quick recap, religion is often at odds with God. Religion is good and nice and everything when we remember that religion is kind of like our way of categorizing knowledge. When we start living for the religion, things just kind of don't work out very well. The Jews did it, for instance. They, they thought, you know, this is the law that God gave us, and we want to make sure that we don't break it. So we want to add a bunch of laws on top of these laws and hold people to it. But their laws imprisoned the Jews where they literally could not see the Messiah for the sake of there were just too many rules. There was just too much. And it wasn't something that God anticipated, or not, the wrong word. Um, intent, in, yes, it's not, yes, intended. That's something that God intended. Um, the law was more like a guardrail. You know when you're driving down the road and there's a guardrail there so you don't go off the cliff? That's what the law was meant to be. It was a temporary guide, is what Paul says. A temporary guide <coughs> to keep us from sinning. Well, obviously it was not adequate. It was never complete. It was not sufficient. It was faulty. It was not complete. God never intended for it to be perfect. He intended for it to be a guide. And once Jesus came, it wasn't even needed. Well, so then what's happened over the course of time is people have kind of gone to two extremes. One says, okay, I have to follow a bunch of rules and regulations in order to honor God, which, I mean, is a good, it's a good attempt, I guess. And then other people say, hey, I don't have to live by any standards. I can just do whatever I want because I'm free. Um, if you read the Bible, um, the, the Greek people usually had a problem with knowing where the line was with freedom. You know, oh, I can just do whatever. We see that, in, for instance, in the book of First and Second Corinthians. Ah, it's fine. This guy is, you know, having relations with his father's wife. It's fine. It's fine. It's like, no, actually, it's not fine. <laughs> see what I mean? Like, and uh, then on the other side, you know, we have the Jews trying, like, Paul talks about this in Galatians. They're still trying to enforce the law. They're still trying to make you get circumcisions. This is, this isn't. You're not, this is not how this works. And so you see Paul constantly in this bridge between legalism and no rules at all. And so tonight we're, we're going to look at the second part. Last time was uh, basically good characters and good works are better than suits and robes. We talked about don't be, don't, don't be naked. Uh, we talked about how the way in, with religion, you know, you have to dress the part. You always have to be fancy. And if you don't wear the right clothes, you're not accepted and all this stuff. But we saw that Christians really have no dress regulations according to the New Testament. So, kind of a moot point. And, uh, but instead, what the New Testament does tell us to do is it says to dress in patience and kindness and goodness and love and those things. But we looked at that the last week. If you didn't get a chance to hear it, don't worry about it. It's online. You can find it on Facebook or on YouTube. Um, if you'd like more information on that, you can grab me afterwards. Um, but... Tonight, we're looking at something, uh, something very, very similar, and that's titles and honor. See, legalistic people, <laughs> they love titles and they love rec recognition. They love for people to pat them on the back. They love to, to get honor in front of people. And uh, Jesus even brought this up with the Pharisees. He said, oh, they, they love to wear these nice fancy robes, you know, and they love for people to recognize, and they like to have the best seats at the, at, the, at the feast, and they just love everybody to bow down and worship the ground that they walk on. Well, that's something you often see with legalistic people. You know, oh, you owe me. You know, you see a lot of pastors do this. I'm a pastor, so-and-so. It's like, okay, buddy, get your nose out of the air. Um, or sometimes people who get a doctorate's degree, you know, oh, I'm a Doctor Michael, oh, sorry there, buddy. You know, but uh, um, and you see the same thing with legalism. People who use religion just to get people to respect them. But uh, but God, you know, obviously, besides what He outright said, just real plain and simple. You know, uh, those who are first 
what to be first will be last, and the last will be first, that for instance. I mean, he kind of said things all over the place um, about not wanting to be first and not wanting everybody to, to worship you. Um, so we're going to look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. Verse 19. And uh, this is kind of the thing that you have happen with legalism. This is an engraved plaque on something that somebody bought. And you actually saw this a lot more in years past than you do now. Basically, the idea was that somebody would buy the church pews, and then they would get their name engraved on it so that everybody could say, hey, what a good job that person did. Um, it was yet another scheme that Satan used to get our attention off of God and onto us and our problems. Here's another example here. That is reserved seating. I don't know if you can see that from there, but reserved seating. Well, I paid for those chairs. I better be able to sit in them. Well, it's not all about you. <laughs> it's not all about you. That's what we like to call forgetting what the church is actually about. So if you read in Matthew 6, 19 through 20, this is what it says. It says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, like for instance this. This would be a good example of that. Where, uh, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. So when I first read this, I thought he was talking about um, stuff that we could cram in our mansions in heaven. You know, basically, the idea is this. If we do all the right things, and then when we get to heaven, God's going to give us just all kinds of stuff. There's going to be this moving truck that backs up into our, into our awesome mansion. We're going to have these gates around our mansion so nobody, none of the other people in heaven, you know, you go to that side of heaven. I'm going to go to this side of heaven. And that's just how, you know, arms distance here. But you know what the funny thing is? is as much as this phrase appears in hymnals from 50, 100, 150 years ago, the Bible never says that we will get mansions. It says, I will I go to prepare a dwelling place for you. One translation says mansion, and that's the King James Version, which is, by the way, not overly accurate. I mean, it was first published in 1611, so that should tell you, hey, maybe we, maybe we ought to reanalyze the text here. Uh, but anyways, um, so I thought he was talking about stuff, you know, hey, if you... You, you should store up for yourself all these treasures in heaven. So basically, I have a guitar here on earth. Well, in heaven, I'm going to have this awesome guitar that never rusts, and it's going to be in my mansion, in my third bedroom, next to my indoor pool. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, that doesn't really make sense when you read all of what Jesus is talking about. Now, there will be rewards in heaven. Okay, but not like that. It's not going to be something where it's like heavenly versions of the things we have on earth. It's not going to be like that. So that, that kind of brings up the question, so, so what are these rewards? Well, when God says, you know, store up for yourself treasures in heaven, so what does that look like? Well, I can tell you a few things that it's not. If you back up to to verse 1 of chapter 6. Because remember, if you want to understand something better, look at the context. Look at what's around that verse. Don't just take one verse and... Okay, so this is what it says in verse 1. Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. So the first thing, it's not a title. Whatever this treasure is in heaven, it's not going to be something that we can stand over all the other people in heaven and say, ha ha ha, look at my title. <laughs> You may have been a doctor on in, in heaven, on earth, but in heaven, I am the big shot. You know, it's, <laughs> it's not going to be like that. So, okay, if it's not a title, then what is this treasure? We'll go down to verse 24, once again, the same chapter. It says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Okay, well, that kind of brings up a second point. It's not wealth. So whatever this treasure is, it's not a title and it's not wealth. Okay. Well, I guess our, our options are getting a little bit limited here. So then we go to back, back up to verse 19, the verse that we've already looked at. 
And it says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy. So that kind of strongly suggests that it is not possessions either. Well, so now we got a little bit of a, a little bit of a conundrum going on here. God, I, you said that you were going to give us treasures. You're not giving me any of the things that I get, that I want. Well, <laughs> obviously it's our perspective that's wrong. Um, in fact, if you look at Second Peter three twelve, I'm not going to turn there right now, but it says that everything will burn, that everything in the earth is going to burn. God is literally going to follow after you, and anything you build in this life, He will destroy. Anything, He is going to burn this whole world. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. Well, that kind of puts things in perspective. Maybe we shouldn't cling on to our possessions too tightly, remembering that they are going to burn. Let's say, for instance, you buy a phone. It will probably not last you till you die. Phones last about three years. Maybe. We'll average it out there. Well, so let's say it does outlast you. You will still die, and your thing will simply be another thing in the, in the garbage. Okay, let's say it is honored and is possessed. I have... Isaiah's phone, ha, it's mine now. Ah, I outlived him long enough to take his phone. Well, okay. Then, once again, earth will eventually be burned. So it was kind of a, not really that important. In fact, in 1 Corinthians, Paul tells us that in heaven, prophecies will cease. Think about this. In the church world, people... People think that there's some Christians who are just there up here. Man, oh man, they're, they are the epitome of righteousness. And up there, they're, you know, there's the people who, who never mess up or never sin. You know, pastors, pastors never sin, right? Then there's, you know, the people who prophesy or give words of knowledge in church. Because, I mean, they're more spiritual than everyone else in the whole church combined, obviously. I mean, come on. God only uses perfect people, right? No. Uh, so, you know, you got all these, and then, and then Paul says this comment in, in 1 Corinthians. He says, where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there's these gifts that are being used in the church now, they're not going to make it into heaven. So don't glory too much in how God uses you on earth, because that's not going to make it into heaven. So you mean I can't even brag and lord it over people that I'm using the gifts of the Spirit and they're not? Well, then what good is it if I can't lord it over someone else? You see, sometimes we don't really think things through in what the Bible says. We value too highly, I don't want to come to that yet. We value too highly um, things that are passing away in our lives. We, we pull out our hair and go crazy because of making bills or because of a job that, I mean, if you get fired, you'll just get hired and someone, they'll just hire someone else tomorrow. I mean, I'm not saying you shouldn't work hard, and, absolutely, but remember that your life is more than work. Your life is more than the expensive clothes that you buy. Your life is more important than your credit score, or your debt, or your school loans, or your education. It's more, it's more than that. Life cannot be condensed to something so small as financial difficulties. Remember that. We put an emphasis on things that are passing away. God, God doesn't. So we're still left with this problem of, so what is this treasure that God's talking about? One time I was driving to Texas, and uh, if you've ever made the trip from Albuquerque to Amarillo, you know what boredom is. Okay, you make it out of Albuquerque, you're like, hey, there's mountains, this is nice. Well, say goodbye to the mountains. Then you have plains and plains of weeds. I mean, goodness sakes. And then you get to West Texas, and it gets worse. First off, you got to smell. There's like this whole cow thing going on over there, which is fine for them. But the smell needs to stay over there, man. Cows, they stink. They just stinky things. So then you make it past that. I mean, just we're talking about flat, and there's nothing to see. There's no sights. It's just, you know what Amarillo's big tourist attraction is? They have these cars that are stuck in the dirt that people spray paint. It, it's, it's a man-made thing because there's nothing else to see out there. I mean, it's just flat, which is fine if you want to live there. I, mean, I personally prefer mountains, but whatever. So then you get past that, and then you start hitting all these little towns where the speed limit goes from like 70 to like 20. 
And if you miss that speed limit sign, man, oh man, there's like five cops waiting for you. And it's like, I honestly didn't see. It was hidden behind a tree. I don't live here. I don't know there's a, a stop sign there. So anyways, you get past this, and right when you think that you're going to die out of boredom, you start seeing trees. Trees, Bilbo! And it's just so wonderful. And then you start to see green trees, and that even gets better. And then you get to like Dallas, and you're like, hey, if it wasn't for all the drunks, this would be really nice. And uh, you know, well, but I was on my way through that barren, deserty nastiness before you hit Tucum Carry. And uh, I was texting on my phone because I was a kid, and kids do stupid things. You shouldn't text, on, uh, text and drive. That's just a terrible drive, terrible idea. But I was a kid, and I was stupid. So I was texting and driving, and I dropped my phone. Well, I look up, and there's nothing there. So I reached down to get it, and I push it further into the seat. I'm like, aw. Now, what a, what a responsible driver would have done is probably pulled over, grabbed my phone, and then put it somewhere where I wouldn't mess with it for the remainder of the car ride. But once again, kids do stupid things. So I also so then I have to reach further down under the seat to try to get this stupid thing, and uh, well I look up and there's a diesel there, and he just got onto the highway and he's going I, I don't want to say, for sure, but I'm pretty sure he was going, negative speed, like if five miles per hour is really slow he's going like negative 100 miles per hour I don't know. So I'm coming up on this guy, and I'm flying, because I used to go 82 miles per hour every time that I drove. It was my favorite thing to do. Sometimes I would even go 92. I used to drive this Ford, you know what, different, start for a different time. Um, but anyways, I'm coming up, and there's this diesel there, and I'm like, oh crap. So I jerk the wheel to the side, and my car does this. And I end up in the, in the median, and I'm just sitting there like, whoa, that was close. It was so intense that it bent my back, or front, front or back tire, I don't remember, but it bent my tire in half. <laughs> yeah, those were, those were some times. But my point being this, when I looked before I reached down for my phone, the truck was there. I just didn't notice him. Then when I started reaching down, the truck was moving over. I just didn't notice him. And then when I pulled my phone up, the truck was there. But here's the thing. It was a little bit of an optical, what is it, optical illusion, because when you come up to the back of the truck that fast, it doesn't look like you're coming up to it that fast. It really looks weird. And uh, so by the time that, you know, delayed response, I figured out what was going on, it was too late to simply hit the brakes. And my point is this, you know, when we're young, we think we're gonna live forever, right? I mean, nothing's gonna ever touch us, nothing bad will ever happen to us. I mean. Things happen to other people, but not to me. I mean, come on. How could God let anything happen to someone so happen to something someone so pretty? I mean, it's just not going to happen. Well, then, as you get older, you're like, I'm going to die. There's one of these days where I am going to die, and things do wear out. You, when you're a kid, you buy a new phone. You're like, look at this new phone. And then when you get old, you're like, look at this big waste of money that will wear out within a few short years. Your whole perspective changes. And it's kind of like coming up on that truck. You get blindsided and you're like, wow, I, I, it came up a lot faster than I, I thought it was going to. And that's kind of my point with things. We, we put value in all these things that are passing away. We think that they're so important and we, we, just, we just want more of it. And we want, oh, this will make me happy. This will make me happy. Spoiler alert, things won't make us happy. So then in an attempt to, I guess, justify our short lives, we try to do this thing where we impress God, and we try to look at all we, all I'm doing, God. You know, I'm, I'm earning a name for myself. When I get to heaven, God will, well, wow, He'll really be amazed at me. And we even associate business with busyness, with value. Basically, the idea of running something like this: I have to be busy, or I won't be valuable. And so we, 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 tell you, we tell ourselves that we have to be as busy as humanly possible. We sign our kids up for 50 different sports every year. We, we, we have, have our schedules so full where we never have a night off. We forget how to be people. We forget how to interact. And a big part of the church was meant to be fellowship. But in the modern time frame, there's no time. There's no time for fellowship because our schedules are too busy. The glue that holds the church together is fellowship. We don't have time for it. So 
in, in an attempt to make up for the difference, legalism, religion, has tried to fill up the gap that we're missing in our hearts for human interaction with busyness. If I do 50 million things, if I do 50 million things, and so we miss the whole big picture. And I do want to say, do good works, but remember that life is more than what we do. And we cannot earn God's favor. Our salvation is unwarranted. God's favor is unwarranted. It's not like you're going to come to a day and say, God, you owe me to bless me because of what I've done. Uh, no, he doesn't. So our value is not connected to our busyness. I'm not saying be lazy, but I am saying remember that life is more than the things you do. Work, but remember that life is more than work. Do ministry. A big part of church is serving other people. Serve somebody, but remember that life is more than busyness. So, a few things of what, what, uh, what is this treasure? Well, the first clue we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, and we're just going to blow past the rest of this. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, it says this, But as it is written things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard, and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. Translation, the, the rewards in heaven are beyond anything you can imagine. They have nothing to do with this short, miserable, painful life. I have no idea what that means, but I know that it's more than I've ever known. Another clue is in 1 John chapter 2, verse 25. I'm not going to turn there. You can turn there if you want to. But it basically says that our, tre our treasure, maybe part of our treasure, I'll let you be the deciding factor on that, is our eternal life. God has a great treasure for us, eternal life. Eternal life and a life beyond anything we've ever known. Don't you get tired of waking up with aches and pains? Well, there's this cure-all, and if you order now. <laughs> but this one, it really is a cure-all. See what I mean? It's something that, that, that it's not like a, a late-night uh, commercial. It actually does what it says it'll do. Do you ever get tired of your friends dying? Do you ever get tired of getting sick and having to go to the doctor for things? Well, lucky for you, I know a guy. <laughs> And then uh, another thing, now this is really, this when I read this, we were doing a study in young adults, our young, young adults class, and when I read this, it blew my mind. Like, have you ever been driving a car, stupid, and something, you hear something pop, and just, you hear something fall out of your engine, and it just hits the ground, and you're like, uh-oh. That wasn't good. No? You, you never, okay, good, that's probably a good thing. But that's what happened when I read this, I mean, <laughs> Philippians chapter 4, verse 1 says this, Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy, and, this is the part I want you to get, and my crown. In this way stand firm in the Lord. Did you already just say, you are my crown? Jim Cimbalo said it like this, Paul was more excited about them than anything or any achievement. See, our crown and our glory is people we serve, not things we serve. There's a big difference, a really big difference. My crown is what Philippians 4.1 says. Do you pour into people like they are your crown? What's your title? What's your glory? What's your honor? Serving them. That is your crown. That is your crown. Because when you get to heaven, he's not going to be concerned about what titles you had here on earth. He's not going to. He's not going to care how much money you made. He's not going to care about all the things you owned. They're going to go into the fire. He doesn't care. He doesn't care. You know all these little things that we argue and squabble about. He doesn't care about any of that. But our glory that we'll present to God on that day, our crown, will be. 
his people. All those years that I prayed for them, that I served them, that I, I did what was best for them rather than getting even. All those times that they lied behind my back and they did all these things behind my back and I repaid good for the evil that was shown. This is my curse. And that is a sacrifice that God will accept. And that is a sacrifice that will not burn. So in conclusion, just a real quick breakdown here. Our riches never passing and from God, our titles and honor, honor people we served. Well, that sounds like a win-win situation to me. Don't love treasure that passes. Don't love titles. Don't love receiving honor from people. Don't, don't love money. Don't love things. You know what happens when the kids break something that I really, really liked in the house? This is what I say. It's replaceable. It's okay. And I really do mean it. Because there's nothing in my house that I'm more attached to than my own kids. Doesn't that make sense? If they break my guitar, eh, it's a piece of wood. God's going to burn it anyways. Like, it's not that big of a deal. So, invest in treasure that is waiting, that is waiting there for you. People and God's reward. Don't, don't let religion... And the way you've always heard things. Don't let that have its final word. And don't let it stop you from growth. Isaiah 58.10 says something that I think would be a great way to finish this whole thing here. Because, you know, in church, we hear it a certain way. We pride ourselves on how much we know about this and that and the other thing. And how, you know, all this stuff. And, oh, look at me. I, I come to every service, and so that makes me a better Christian than you. And I don't know. We just... We just have all these rules and regulations as to how we're better than someone else. But Isaiah 5810 is a great way to way to really wrap up this, this this conversation on titles and honor. And if you give yourself to the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then your light will rise in darkness and your gloom will become like midday. I think that God cares that we reach other people. Remember, it's not about us. And whereas religion says, hey, you need to get yourself a, you need to get yourself a title. People need to look up to you. That's not what God says. And I do want to assure everybody, I'm not Pastor Michael. I am Michael. I heard, whenever I hear somebody say Pastor Michael, it irks me in a way that, like, eh, you know, when people slide their nails on the black on the chalk. Eh. Not because of Pastor, although that, that I guess would be a part of it. But because I don't like people to call me by titles. There's this world-renowned Egyptologist. He has single-handedly done more valuable research on Egyptian pharaohs than any one single person that I know of. And his work has been foundational. Foundational to much of what other people have built on in Egypt's in Egyptian history books. His name is Kenneth Kitchen. He has never once gotten a doctorate, and people have oftentimes tried to encourage him. You need to get a doctorate. He said, no, I want people to just call me Kenneth Kitchen. I'm just Kenneth Kitchen. He's a Christian, by the way, and he actually wrote a very lengthy book um, defending the Bible as actually um, historical. But that's the conversation for another day. Moral of the story being here, it's not about us. It's not about our titles. It's not about our honor. It's not about our riches. And that's something that legalism and religion tries to tell us, that we need to grab some for ourselves or else nobody's going to give it to us. So we're going to stop there. I just want to remind you of a few things. On Wednesday night at 7, we have our Going Deeper. This week we'll be talking about uh, church discipline, uh, looking at Matthew chapter 18. Um, and next Sunday morning, uh, Chuck is going to preach again. Um, it was not connected to this week's um, sermon, so I forgot what it was called. But... Um, uh, I even had him. Oh, you are not alone. I wrote it down. Das gut. Okay. You are not alone. And the next Sunday night, uh, we're going to be looking at part three of Religion vs. God. And that is going to be God's Ways. <laughs> Write down your notes, guys. Um, if I could have... Um, uh, Joe, would you mind 